Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to find out what these things on the end of uh, here are called, or what they do. And so I did what any self-respecting journalist does, and I looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> and um, they, it said very helpfully that they're basically the things on the ends of your arms, which didn't really shine much light. And I thought, well, perhaps they're a bit more than that. Perhaps they are a kind of repository of our memories. They're everything we've ever touched, everything we've ever done, every one we've ever touched, <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just that our whole lives are in these things. And um, what I thought was that they are, more importantly than that for me, they are the story of capitalism. They're kind of where we came from and the future of it. And to try and tell you the story of capitalism in 10 minutes is going to be, my version is going to be a bit of a tall order, but I thought I'd give it a go. And I'd start with my granddad, who was an immigrant who came to Britain in the 40s. He had, came from Corsica, he couldn't speak English, he had no education, but he could play the cello. And so he basically could make a living with his hands. And his existence is quite similar to mine in a way, because we've come full circle, and he lived a precarious life, a freelance life, the life that we all <laughs> lead. Um, but his hands were the way that he could make a living, and he played in cafe orchestras and basically earned some money, perhaps, at the end of the night. And um, it struck me that um, that circle that we've reached, where we've gone from the precariousness of existence in the 30s, 40s, we had the welfare state, what economists call the Great Compression, the period between 1950 and 2000, where you had a job for life, there was stability, seemingly. That's gone again and we're back to a world that existed, my granddad's world. But that period, um, that period of seeming stability was the time when I think we became divorced from our hands. We literally became disenfranchised from using them. And it's a very interesting process that, that made that happen. And I think it was to do with a key, one key instrument, and that was consumerism. And consumerism was an incredible invention, and it's kind of what's brilliant about it is that it's the conspiracy that turned out to be true. It's actually the thing that we all say, you know, they, they, they tried to do this thing to us to make us buy stuff, and it can't possibly be true. This is freedom of will. You know, we, do, we want to do this stuff. No, they actually, they manufactured it all. And um, it started in the, back in the 30s, um, through three kind of key instruments, three things that made it possible to become divorced from our hands. And actually what consumerism was about was about making us middle class. You know, the idea that before that you used, if you used your hands, you were like a, you know, you toiled, you were working class. It was literally manual labor, manual, meaning a hand. And what you were about doing was about removing yourself from that space, making yourself middle class, white collar, doing a job where you used your brain and the hands were wrong, brain good, hands wrong, you know. And the, the, the instrument for that, as I said, was consumerism. It was to make you middle class. So what it was about doing was forcing you to buy stuff or convincing you to buy stuff that you sort of didn't realize you needed. I went to uh, a fire station uh, outside San Francisco last year and they have a, a light bulb in that fire station and it's been burning for over a hundred years. It's a hundred year old light bulb that's never been changed. And um, you kind of wonder that perhaps the CEOs of all the big corporations across the world should go to that fire station and kind of kill the little elderly firemen who work there, um, or at least switch the light off. Because there, in that space, you've got basically the secret of where capitalism went. Which was, there was a cartel of light bulb manufacturers set up in the 40s called the Phoebus Cartel. It was all the light bulb manufacturers got together. And they basically said, we can't have this. We can't have a light bulb that goes on forever. <laughs> We've got to basically limit the lifespan of this light bulb. Any company that builds light bulbs that last longer than a set amount of time will put them out of business. This cartel was the beginning of planned obsolescence. And that then fed into everything, into every consumer durable, into washing machines, into cars, into literally everything. The second important tool that they used was, well, you know, you kind of think the 50s, you got to that point where people are buying stuff, 
And um, the, the 50s is a period of naivety. We always think the 50s consumer and British society is being naive, but actually people are starting to get wise to planned obsolescence. There were films like The Man in the White Suit, which kind of satirized the idea that business was duping the public. And so uh, another genius of marketing comes along, a guy called Alfred Sloan. Now, in the 50s, he invents the iPhone. He says that essentially, we need to reprogram the consumer. No longer can we just sell them stuff, dupe them into buying things that, that then break. They're kind of wise to this. We need to actually alter the psychology of the consumer, make them want the new over the old. Not fix things, not repair them, buy the new thing. He ran General Motors, Alfred Sloan, and what he said was, we want the consumer to buy a new car every year. Every single year, a new car to go with a new coat. And uh, the way to do this was through color or the add-ons, you know, the superficial add-ons, the tail fins, little, you know, the radio changes slightly. So basically what he was doing is he was doing what the iPhone does today. It's got to a certain peak, in a way, of technological innovation. And so now all it can do is kind of accessorize it, make a gold one or a pink one or one that has something slightly different. That essentially was pioneered by this guy, Alfred Sloan. The second thing they did was they had this, there was another great guy, and I've got to kind of, you know, take my hat off to these people because in a way they're kind of evil geniuses of capitalism <laughs> that they came up with these amazing ideas. There was a guy, guy called Stanley Rezor, and he basically said, he was one of the models for Mad Men. I don't know if anyone's seen, obviously everyone's seen Mad Men, but Mad Men was a kind of, that character, the Don Draper character, was a sort of amalgam of about six different guys on Madison Avenue. And one of them, he actually has the lines in the, in, in the series that were taken from this guy. He said, you know, everyone says sex sells, right? He never said sex sells. He actually said the complete opposite. He, this was his phrase. He said, sex sells if you're selling sex. He said, the thing that makes people buy things, the thing that sells is fear. And he said, what he meant by fear was he said, freedom from fear. We need to sell the consumer happiness, happiness through freedom from fear. So, people don't have fears. What we need to do is create fears for them. The first fantastic fear that they invented rather prosaically was bad breath. Who'd have thought bad breath? Bad breath wasn't even a condition, but they invented a term for it, halitosis. It didn't exist before. Halitosis had a scientific sound to it. They made all these ads where they had primarily women in them saying, you're never going to get a boyfriend if you've got bad breath. This is a disaster. Suddenly, Listerine was launched. Listerine became a global hit. How on earth did they do it? Freedom from fear. The freedom from fear is now used to sell everything from hand gel, hand wash around, freedom of hygiene. Even the Hummer, that SUV, was sold off the back of 9-11. They said we can market a military vehicle as a domestic car. So there was this fantastic kind of um, creation of capitalism, of consumerism around the idea of these, of these things. The final one of these fantastic um, ideas was the infantilization of the consumer, which was to basically turn us all into children. And uh, that was a very, very, very clever thing. George Lucas, he said, I'm not really a film director at all, I'm a toy manufacturer. What they did when they created the Star Wars franchise was he had a vision to roll this out. He did a massive deal with a huge toy manufacturer prior to selling the movie. No one in Hollywood really got what he was about because before then it was all the kind of raging bulls thing. It was about artistry and, you know, the outsider. And he said, no, 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 this is, this is about a franchise. This is about licensing, marketing. This is about a giant machine that we can create here, which he did. What, um, cons what manufacturers learned off the back of Star Wars was basically how to use techniques that had been developed on kids and use them to sell to adults. That was the really key thing. So the key thing here was, if you think about uh, Peppa Pig as a kind of licensing tool, right? You stick Peppa Pig on every lunchbox across Britain and you've got kids going, oh, I must have Peppa Pig. David Beckham is basically the equivalent of Peppa Pig. It's kind of <laughs> licensing. It's 
very clever licensing thing. Um, so what they did was they created this amazing machine, this fantastic machine called consumerism. And um, the, 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 the greatest bit of this infantilization part was that they keyed into this, this aspect of our psychology, which is, I want it, I want it now. What a child says, when a three-year-old says, I want that and I want it now. Actually, if we can get adults to do that, instant gratification, they can have it, right? They want that. I, I'd really like to buy that guitar. I don't know how much it costs. You're going to have to tell me how much it costs, right? I maybe don't have that money on me, right? How could I buy it now? How could I take that home right now? Credit. Credit is the way of doing it. The credit card is a way of infantilizing the consumer by creating the I want it now, I can have it now, and not have to pay for it until further down the line. So the entire system that kind of collapsed sort of seven years ago, debt, starts in the kind of early 70s, mid 70s with credit and so on. Well, what all of this has to do is about turning us into consumers and divorcing us from using our hands. It was about aspiration. It was about aspiring to be middle class, aspiring to be something that wasn't working class and using your hands to make a living. But that kind of system came under strain. It came under strain in the 70s with the OPEC oil crisis and so on. And then you had these fantastic fantastic um, new strategists who were about bringing back the precariousness that we'd had before the welfare state, before the job for life. And there's, I'll give you an example. There's just some really stupendous things that were done. There were these two guys who worked for McKinsey's, who are a marketing company, strategist company. They go into big corporations, as you probably know. They say, you need to clean out the dead wood here. You need to, this is how you rationalize. So up until the oil crisis, what you had was you had a system whereby a company would go out and look to make profits by getting new customers. But all of a sudden, with a recession, these guys said, Peters and Waterman, no relation to Pete Waterman, but they were called Peters and Waterman, they said, no, no, the profits that need to come to the shareholders need to be by making cuts within the company. So they said, they, the first clients that they had were a computer company, and they said, what you need to do here is you need to write to the wives of the employees, because this was a time where the husband was the, the breadwinner and the wife was at home making the cakes. You know? So that was the idea. That you would write to the wife, and they said that would be far more effective than taking the guy into the office and having a go at him for not being produ unproductive. They said, you write to the wife, and you say to the wife, this year, Mike isn't going to get his bonus. And therefore, you are not going to get your fur coat. This was in America. I'm kind of creating some weird I Love Lucy type fantasy that they had. Um, and... Lo and behold, it worked. <laughs> the psychology of going into companies and messing with the minds of the employees was about creating the internal market. This was the birth of internal competition, incentivization, the kind of the world that we're living in now, and which I'm making a series about. It's going out in January on BBC Two, so please watch it. And it's absolutely phenomenal. It's phenomenal how it was achieved. So this consumerism and this kind of creation of a culture that was about getting to a point where we could be divorced from using our hands, it kind of hits the buffers, doesn't it? It hits the buffers in 2007 when we have a crisis that's created around debt, around the accumulation of debt, subprime mortgages. The whole system that was set up way back when suddenly hits the buffers. And... Um, you know, what do we think of when we think of 2007 and the crash, right? What do we think of? We think of Occupy, right? We think of the 99% and the 1%, the 1% super wealthy and all the rest of us scrabbling around, right? About a week ago, I went and interviewed one of the four biggest uh, CEOs of one of the four biggest banks in the world. He'd been there right at the very moment where the financial system was about to collapse. And... Um, what was fantastic was that his bank, two years before the collapse, two years before, um, some years before Occupy had coined the term the 99% of the 1%, they had already identified 
the increasing inequality on this planet, not as a problem, but as a business opportunity. So they wrote this report, Plutonomy report, and they said that the future world is diverging into the 1% super wealthy and the 99% everyone else. They said in the report, this is going to be the biggest social problem facing this planet in the 21st century. But, quote, we worry less here at the bank. That was the quote, we worry less. They, they, what they did was they defined society as an hourglass. They said that the future will be, the wealth will be held by the super wealthy at the top, and funnily enough, by the super poor down here at the bottom. They said the opportunity at the top is to sell them Learjets and Bentleys and stuff, you know, super rich, blingy Kardashian stuff. And then the stuff at the bottom is zero hours contracts, payday loans, all the extractive wealth that we can take from the poor. This is a huge, huge opportunity because we've got a lot of very poor people and they're going to be very desperate for money. But the hourglass, the bit in the middle, the bit where it goes thin, I wondered about that and I said, what's that bit? That's the middle class. The middle class will cease to exist as such or in terms of having an income. They're not of interest to us because they're not going to have any money. And I thought, well, I thought back to my granddad and I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, he came as an immigrant to Britain and here I am, I think I'm middle class, <laughs> but actually, you know, what I am is I'm a part of you, perhaps, the world of the new precariousness, the precariat, they call us, the precariat. That's the term for it, the precariat. And um, so what we need to do is return to transferable skills, to our hands, to makers, to the fact that that was what my granddad relied upon to make a living. And not just to make a living, but to feel some humanity, to feel satisfied with himself, to get some kind of sense of satisfaction from his life. And um, this isn't some middle-class indulgence, makers doing stuff. It's, it's going to be a necessity that we reconnect with our hands because the world is changing in a way where it is going to become a necessity. And so these guys, what they're doing here, it's a very nice surfboard, very nice guitar, is actually more than just beautiful objects. It's about a profound shift where we reconnect with ourselves and where we were duped into being disconnected from ourselves by what happened through consumerism. Thank you very much.